You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bors Puya. In this week's program, we have an interview with Clive Arunda from London Black Atheist Group. We'll also be talking about Rouhani's visit to France and Italy and some hidden statues, as well as, of course, a, a fatwa against the use of the word wine in print. A 15-year-old boy who has chopped off his hand because of blasphemy, as well as a wonderful protest of refugees against violence and sexism in Kong. Stay with us. Now, in the week that passed, of course, what everybody has been talking about is Rouhani's visit to Italy and France. And of course, in Italy, the topic of the day was the fact that he visited a museum in which certain nude statues were covered up out of respect for his sensibilities, you know, because he hates women's bodies so much and men's bodies must be covered up completely. Um, the interesting thing <laughs> is that there was not much sort of discussion, so the media was covered natu uh, naturally with the outrage, both in Italy and France as well, and I think in Europe, that um, the um, statesmen and the institution of European governments have succumbed to the um, you know, representative of um, executions and terrorism from Iran. But the other story really is is this is because they want to carry on having trade with the Islamic regime. They have no objection to what's going on in Iran, yeah. you know, in the country that has one of the highest executions. Women have no fundamental rights been taken away from them, uh, child executions, um, and just, you know, oppressive government. And they ca carry on uh, trading with this government. Yeah, I mean, sometimes when you look at the you know, the news being full of statues being covered up and, you know, whether they're going to drink wine or halal meals at their Paris lunch or breakfast, breakfast being too cheap, you realize that actually all of this is sort of a way of keeping us all busy uh, when, in fact, what is actually happening is this massive wheeling and dealing behind the scenes for billions and billions of pounds uh, that will profit really the Iranian regime and the Islam Islamist businesses absolutely. really because no, they're not real businesses in no, a sense. Absolutely, this is part of the uh, ruling mafia in Iran who has control of the key industries um, or the airline, transportation, um, oil industry. It's in the hand of a small group of the um, Islamists who to maintain the power they uh, actually spend a lot of money on uh, exporter of uh, export of terrorism, and and sort of interfering in um, you know other countries like Syria and and Lebanon and Iraq as well. Now to to sustain this government effectively, uh, the trade with this government it's to uh, sustain the current arrangement that exists and yeah. um, and. And it's disgraceful, I think. It is disgraceful. And also when you look at the fact that, of course, you know, Iran is one of the top five execution capitals of the world. It is one of the only countries that executes and sentences juveniles to the death penalty. Girls from the age of nine, boys from the age of 15. And of course, it has... Uh, there's a woman now facing death by stoning and of course you know the the suppression of labor rights activists uh, attacking uh, uh, labor strikes and protests to imprisoning anyone who questions the regime even its so-called election something we discussed in last week's uh, program is a farce you know and the fact that no one can run a very limited number of people can run and only those who are most loyal and who have been selected by the guardian councils and the supreme spiritual leader yeah and I think interesting um, um, thing to note is that there were protests in yeah. both in Italy and France, but it didn't get actually much much coverage. The only um, one was about the uh, um, covering of the statues. The uh, and the most important was was the feminine protest yeah. actually in uh, against Rouhani and uh, execution 
in Iran. Yeah, I mean, it's it, uh, it was a wonderful action of a woman who was seen to be hanging from a bridge uh, with the flag of the Iranian regime painted on her breasts. And it basically said, you know, a regime that executes freedom. And that's exactly what is the case. Rouhani is often hailed as a reformer, though there have been 2,000 executions in the country since he's been president. And reform, uh, you know, as we've always said, has to have real meaning. There has been no change or reforms in the hideous Islamic laws that people in Iran have to live under. But it was very funny because they asked Rouhani, um, you know, whether he had asked for the statues to be covered. And he had said, no, you know, um, the Italians are so hospitable, they just did it themselves. And, you know, I think they would have, maybe he would have felt a lot better if they had a few cranes in city centers hanging people. He and, would have felt at home. Uh, and had all, all Italian women wear the veil, you yeah. know. That would have made him much more comfortable. Maybe they can do that next time around. Yeah, and if, if the, I wonder if the, president or a trade delegation from Italy goes to Iran. Which they will be in a yes. few months. Would they put out uh, statues? Boobs. With boobs. Lots of boobs <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, they, they wouldn't, would they? And wine. No. No. Absolutely. No. Yeah. I mean, the other thing in the news, of course, which is linked to religion uh, and its, its adverse effects on people's lives, is the story of a 15-year-old Pakistani boy. I don't know if you heard about it, but he has, um, basically, he was accused of blasphemy in a mosque. And the story is that uh, you know, the cleric in the mosque was asking people how much they love Muhammad, Islam's prophet, and whether, uh, you know, and everybody raised their hands because everybody loves him. And then he asked, is there anyone here who doesn't follow Muhammad's preachings? And of course, this boy thought he meant, is there anyone who does follow? And so he was the only one who raised his hand. The cleric accused him of blasphemy. He was shamed. And he went home and he cut off his own right because hand we, yeah. because he felt like he needed to atone for this act of blasphemy. I mean, the fear um, that the religious institutions instill in people, especially young people, it's, it's horrible. Uh, and this is not just Islam. The other religions do that. The whole idea of hell, that you go to hell and you burn if you do not um, you know, agree to follow the religious Edicts. I mean, that, that's what it is fundamentally, and uh, young people are very impressionable, and it's really sad. I mean, the people, you know, what's happened to the young person? The guy who was in uh, preaching should have been arrested. Really, well, actually, he has been arrested for incitement to violence uh, and incitement to yeah. hate. But what's happened is the family is saying that they don't want him to be charged. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, he should be in prison. Blasphemy is not a real crime. And it is, you know, it, something has happened to this boy that will affect the rest of, of his, his life. life. Yeah. And yeah. it is a truly, truly, truly an outrage. Yeah. The Iranian regime, it's its minister of Islamic culture and guidance. Islamic guidance? I know, which is sort of like the name itself just gives you chills. First of all, like Islamic culture, you know, it's like anti-culture and guidance is usually misguidance. It's like guiding you the opposite. Wrong direction. Very. It's like <laughs> you need to go this way. Islamic guidance is telling you to go that way. So basically they've issued a new proclamation. It's a sort of fatwa because it is a religious government. And they've said that, uh, you know, the censors are going to be checking books to make sure that there is no reference to the word wine or foreign animals in any book from now on they're going to go page by page to see that that's not the case as well as there's no insults to so you, can't, you can't make any reference so you can't make to, a reference to wine yeah so ha, but ha, don't say the yeah so ha, did they write in the thing that did they refer to wine in the, <laughs> the guidance that issued to everybody uh, well, this is what um, Carl draw, Sharo said. Draw the picture. Yeah, draw a little picture. Yeah. Carl Sharo on um, Twitter, he says, apparently they've decided to remove the word wine in print, but since they can't use the word, it's gotten a little complicated. Well, my problem is about the foreign animals. <laughs> what are foreign hmm. animals? Animals could be foreign. <laughs> I mean, what does that mean? Well, I think this is in reference to the fact that lots of Iranians have dogs, love pets, have you know a huge love of animals. There's a huge lot of resistance against the regime uh, killing of stray dogs, uh, yeah. you know, by injecting them with acid and just horrible things. There have been lots of protests, and so I guess the Iranian 
Australian government the, is saying that having a pet is foreign. It's it's trying to stop the Western onslaught, you know. And so this is one of the ways it's trying to do that, which of course is so pathetic. Isn't I know. It? I mean, this is not going to stop people sort of having pets. A huge number of people in Iran or are drinking a wine. Don't do not yeah, mention the like, the drink. Yeah. Yes. But from next time, you should just have it. Don't mention it. <laughs> So, yeah, so that's the uh, insane, insane, insane fatwa of this week. We're now going to see a interview I did earlier with Clive Aroud. He is the founder and organizer of London Black Atheists. Stay with us and watch this really interesting interview. Hello, Clive. Welcome to our program. I wanted to ask you about becoming an atheist. I read an interview of yours where you said that you felt a lot of anger initially. Can you explain that? Yes, hello, Miriam. I certainly was extremely angry because it's as if you've been lied to all your life. So everything you thought was true actually turns out to be a lie. And so one of my initial feelings, one of my initial emotions was anger. And uh, I felt that I had to do something about it and to try and prevent the same thing happening to other young people um, that had happened to me um, because Ultimately, it's not a very good thing for you to, um, to believe that all these stories are factual, that they're truth, that there's something good about them because it kind of takes away your critical faculties and things which are actually horrific, you start to somehow think of them as normal or as actually a good thing, you know. Um, it's not a good thing for a father to go and kill his son to, because of some sort of crimes that other people have committed. Why is that a good thing? If anybody else did it in real life, we would uh, instantly recognize that it's an extremely wicked and stupid thing to do. And yet, uh, in the Bible, it's the greatest thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. So. Um, it does rob you of your critical faculties. So if there's anything um, that, that made me angry, it was those kind of things that made me angry. You also talk about the fact that uh, you felt quite isolated after you left the church because there is a community there, isn't there? And I think for a lot of ex-Muslims as well. Yes, in fact, the church provides a very good community in terms of you have somewhere to go at the weekends, you know, you talk to people that you know, and they talk to you. Um, you have events during the week. You have all sorts of uh, um, namings and christenings, and uh, you have uh, different uh, kind of entertainment events which the church puts on. You can actually go to different places and for, for picnics and for uh, retreats, they call it. So there's a whole web of social activities. Well, I can tell you that when I became an atheist, um, if I was walking down the road and I saw somebody from my former community walking towards me, they would cross the road to the other side to avoid me altogether. And uh, of course, that's just people I know from, from church, from the social group, you know. You also have um, the same kind of thing going on with, with people much closer to you, your own family. And these people, uh, to some extent, they either uh, regard you as being weird or that, in fact, they should do their best to try and get you back into the fold, you know. So I had people even coming over from, uh, I'm originally from Nigeria, coming over from Nigeria to try and persuade me to go back to being a Christian, you know, because the alternative is that if you're not a Christian, you're not one of us. and. It's, it's, that's, that's the sort of life you're going to suffer from here on in. So, yes, the isolation was pretty terrible at first, and it led to some kind of depression that you feel. A lot of people, I think, who are very deeply religious will tell you that they did suffer 
mentally as uh, after just leaving it's difficult to just walk away and uh, I certainly suffered from that and you know it I took me quite a while to get myself back to feeling as if uh, I was able to function properly it took quite a, a, a good deal of doing but thank goodness I think I'm there <laughs> I mean, some will say, isn't it just easier to just stay in the church, you know? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's as if um, you are, uh, as it were, self-lobotomizing, you know, you're, you're, you're <laughs> killing yourself, you know? That's a good word. <laughs> yes. Um, so, no, I, I, I think it's actually far worse to stay in the church. I think uh, no matter how difficult it is, once you recognize that it's all a pile of junk, it's all a, 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 a mess, it's a, it's, it, there's nothing real to it, there's nothing good about it as well, that you owe it to yourself to get out of the churches, you know, however much of a struggle it might be, just get out, you know, don't, don't waste any more time, you know, because um, I can assure you that once you're out, it's like you've gained the whole universe, you know, you've lost a building somewhere, but you've gained a whole universe. I mean, how can you even compare the two? You know, it's uh, it's wonderful. The things I, I I I I'm interested in now, I could never have said I was interested in them when I was in the church. In fact, um, it's it, I, it's it's completely, utterly different, and it's you need to experience it. It's really wonderful. If you're in the churches, get out. That's my message to you. <laughs> Uh, as well as mosques, of course, for okay. sure. <laughs> um, I guess the other question is, uh, you know, what helps to get you back and feeling okay again after the depression and the isolation? What are some of the things that you did or that people can do to help feel better? Yes. Um, when you first get out, it's very confusing because when you're a believer, that's basically how you approach life, how you approach things. You say, I believe this, and I and uh, you know I believe in uh, th this particular religion. I believe that this particular individual or whatever is the is God. I believe this one is a prophet. I believe uh, in 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 case of Christianity that Mary is the mother of Jesus. And I believe everything you say is I believe. You start with I believe. There's no evidence for any of it. You know, there's no truth in any of it. So one of the things that I had to do was to learn to the difference between what is just uh, something you believe, if you like, and something which is actually factual, evidence-based, and whether you believe it or not, there it is, you know, it doesn't care whether you believe it or not. So if you don't believe in gravity, fine, but if you jump off a roof, you're still going to uh, hit the floor very, very hard. So your belief is irrelevant, in, you know, but, uh, and, and so that's one of the things I had to really get myself doing is to retrain myself to try and think correctly, logically, um, in an evidence-based manner, and uh, also to try and connect with other people. So um, I, first of all, Looked around, uh, looked around on different websites, and I was kind of lurking, you know, which is to say, you're reading what's going on, but you're not actively participating. Then I tried to participate, and it was a bit of a disaster because, um, you know, when you come from the I believe type of line of reasoning, you very, you you very quickly find out that these people say, okay, where's the evidence for these things you're saying? And of course. You're not used to thinking that way. So anyway, I finally got myself able to think in those terms. And, and then I started connecting personally with people by joining groups like the British Humanist Association and Central London Humanists. And, um, I've, you know, but I noticed that, okay, there weren't too many um, people who looked like me, if you like, black people in those organizations or at least they didn't show up if they were members. So I thought, uh, this is not quite right, because in London, at least, we must have at least 10%, if not more, of ethnic minorities. So, uh, But I certainly did not see 10% of the uh, ethnic minorities in those, in those organizations. So um, I, I thought, 
together with some friends that we should do something about it. So four of us on the 26th of October 2012 started London Black Atheists and that has also helped because it's not just a group that deals with atheism, it, it also provides a social life. And uh, we've gone from four people to well over 300 today. So, and it's growing all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed that interview with Clive Arruda about, uh, you know, leaving religion. And I think for me, it's an important interview because it's, you know, the things that he talks about are actually things that millions of people across the globe face, whether they're leaving Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, what have you. It's very often this feeling where, you know, anger, isolation, possibly even depression. And what I think is important about this is to show that actually a lot of the feelings that one does feel is not, you know, um, strange or abnormal, because that's what a lot of people feel like they're, they're not normal anymore because of all the pressures that are involved. That I, actually it's a very normal thing to go through and that it does take time like many important changes in one's life and that it shouldn't, you know, one should realize that there are many other people out there like Clive, like themselves, who might be questioning or wanting to leave or have left religion. Absolutely. I think there are two points in Clive's interview that um, was a striking for me. One was his personal experience that that's shared across uh, many uh, religion. And the, um, and um, the other point um, was the uh, how he felt liberated. And that's it. Leaving religion gives you space. Uh, as Clive said, you might lose a house, but you win the whole universe. And that's beautiful. I mean, that's, that's what it gives you a possibility to think freely. And that's such an important uh, quality that one could have. Think freely without any restriction. And that's, that's the bit which was a striking for me when yeah. I listened to Clive's interview. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, is very much similar to, to many experiences is this sense of liberation. I think, you know, uh, I've spoken to a lot of people who've left Islam, for example, who've become atheists now. And, you know, when they talk about all the problems they face, whether it's leaving their family, isolation, threats possibly, intimidation, um, you know, losing every loved one and community that they had, you know, when you ask them, was it worth the risk? You know, do you wish you hadn't said anything? They'll always say that this feeling of freedom and liberation, to be able to think for yourself and not to be lying to yourself at least, mm -hmm. um, is the greatest feeling and it is worth every risk. And I think that is something, you know, that truly helps one be more fully human. Absolutely. Uh, the other point I think is important to note with the, um, to some extent, growth of religion in um Africa and within the uh, um, co communities, African communities in Britain and Europe, uh, you, you'll see the growth of atheism and demand for secularism. And uh, London Black, Black Atheists, uh, you know, it, it's an important part of that um, reconstitution, uh, reconstituting the, you know, the defense of uh, basic hum humanity and free thinking. And that's such an important, such important role they have to play. The slice of life this week is of the thousands of Syrian refugees who went out to protest the mass sex assaults that took place in that city. They held up placards saying we are all cold. Uh, they said no to sexism and racism and they handed out flowers to women. It was a fantastic show of real human solidarity, irrespective of one's migration status, irrespective of one's gender. It was the fact that, you know, this is something for men and women, not just in Cologne, but everywhere. I think this is important. And this resistance and human solidarity is continuing. The other day, a Syrian pianist uh, went to the centre of Cologne and played a, a lovely piece of music. And we need to reflect this. And that's where it keeps people together. 
and overcomes all the difficulties. Yeah, I mean, it reminds me of, you know, you, you hear about pianists uh, in Sarajevo, for example, as well as in other places, the war-torn places, where you hear of pianists playing, you know, in places where people have been killed and slaughtered. And in a sense, this shows, you know, that music is one way in which people can link up with, uh, you know, across across the world in in showing the human side of, yeah. of all of us. So it, it was a wonderful sort of act of solidarity and one that we need to all, you know, support unconditionally. And reflect on. And reflect on, This yeah. This brings us to the end of our program. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We thank you for all your support. We hope this week's program is going to have, um, you know, be better quality. Less Unfortunately, yeah, we had some sound issues in the last program. So we apologize for that. And hopefully it won't be the same this week. And until next week, we'll see you again at the same time and same place. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.